So I did some research and I discovered that a lot of educational experts say that sexual harassment starts in seventh grade. They pinpoint seventh grade as, as the time when it starts. And I spoke to a number of teachers who told me, um, actually, we see it well before seventh grade. But the notion is that seventh grade is when it starts. And I thought, is there a book that addresses this? And when I realized that there wasn't one, I thought, OK, we need to have a book like this on the shelves. Kids need to read it because they need to discuss this stuff and think about this stuff well before high school when it comes, you know, into full bloom. Welcome to What's the Big Idea? I'm your host, Dan Carney. I probably don't need to tell you, dear listener, how turbulent middle school can be for young people. Between puberty, friend groups, school, and increased awareness of world events, just to name a few things, it's a time of intense growth and identity shaping. As adults, parents, teachers, coaches, mentors, it's so vital that we reach young people at this stage in their development to help them grow into confident, positive contributors to their communities and people who cultivate healthy relationships. And a fantastic way to do this is through books. Getting the right books in their hands, books that speak to them on their level, relevant to their lives, books that deliver the messages they need to hear, is a powerful way to prompt deep thought, conversation, and reflection. But which books? See, this is where I get stuck. Because as much as I love so many young adult titles, that particular genre tends to take on important teen issues in a way that middle school students aren't ready for. And frankly, a lot of schools would be wary of teaching. On the other hand, a lot of books that are promoted as middle grade are too cute, too babyish. There's no edge. Today's episode is with a writer who's found the sweet spot. Barbara D. is the author of 12 novels about middle school students and for middle school students and anyone else who cares about middle school students. Her novels take on topics like sexual harassment, mental health, and addiction, and they do so in a way that is both age-appropriate and authentic. One thing that really stood out to me in our conversation was the amount of research Barbara puts into her books. A novel for middle school students might sound, I don't know, simple, but getting it just right, as you'll hear, requires a lot of time with experts, parents, teachers, and young people. I'll link Barbara's books in the show notes. After listening to our chat, I really encourage you to go out and pick up one of her books. Okay, here's Barbara D. I'm approaching this interview as a middle school teacher and a parent, not as a book critic. Um, but I will say this, I've read a number of books for young people in my role as a teacher and as a parent. And I often find that what we call young adult fiction is often, it comes in too high for our middle school students, it's too mature. But then when I look at what is categorized as middle grade, middle school, is often babyish, uh, I, a little patronizing, frankly. Before we get into some of your uh, books and how, your writing process and everything about you, how do you thread that needle when you're approaching a book where you can reach, really reach kids in that middle school level? Well, I think, oh, thank you, first of all, for saying that. And I completely agree. I think there's a real need for books for middle schoolers that are not babyish, traditional middle grade books, but you know, they have a little bit of an edge to them. They need to have a little bit of an edge to them, um, but they don't go as far as the YA world goes. Um, I think there are two things that I think about. The first and most important thing is voice. I think when you are writing for middle schoolers, you have to get the voice right, first and foremost. And if you are writing and you sound like you know, a middle-aged mom, and you have that middle-aged mom sensibility, it's a real turnoff. Kids immediately can tell that it's the book is just not working. Um, 
and I think point of view comes from the voice. It may seem counterintuitive, like first you start with the point of view and from that comes the voice, but for me, voice comes first. And if I can get the voice right, I get the point of view. The second thing is that I think you have to embrace the whole middle schooler as a middle schooler. And by that, I mean, you can't worry about making your character too likable. If you make your character too likable, then the character is spunky and sweet. And you get that sort of character that I think you're alluding to, who just does not seem appropriately middle school aged, um, middle, middle school aged, yes. Um, so when I'm creating a character, I am not afraid to make the character moody, wrongheaded, judgmental, silly, um, overly sensitive, argumentative. I think if you know middle schoolers, you know that they can be difficult creatures. They're also wonderful creatures, but there's a whole range of behaviors that they have that you need to reflect in your books. And I think, you know, another thing is that you have to acknowledge that kids in middle school have full access to all the information that's out there on the internet. They know all of the horrors of the world right now, and they're anxious about them. And if you write books that don't embrace those issues, then you are doing a disservice for kids. You know, they need to have a way of processing all that information. And, you know, books are a great way for them to do that because, you know, we can show the grown up perspective. We can take the kid on a journey where they get more understanding. Um, we, we can, we can show conflicts. We can end on a hopeful note. Um, so, you know, if we don't recognize that kids are thinking about things like sexual harassment or mental illness or addiction or climate change, um, we're, we're not meeting their needs. So, you know, I, I tried to do all of, all of that in my fiction. One thing I think you do really well is, is you take those difficult issues, which you bring it, you bring it right down to the personal level. The, the characters are not, it's not theoretical. They're not reading about it somewhere. They are dealing it with their, in their own lives. And something that stands out to me that just can't not be a coincidence, and I'm sure middle school teachers everywhere would be nodding along, be saying this, that the importance of grade seven. Grade seven is the year, and many of your characters are in grade seven. Why did you pick um, that particular year level to situate your, your character stories? I remember once I was talking to a school counselor, and um, she had migrated from grade seven to grade eight, and I asked her how her year was going, and she said, oh, it's so much easier. It's like kids flip a switch in grade eight, <laughs> and they become very different. She said, when I was a school counselor for grade seven, um, I never was able to even drink coffee. I, I actually ran into her at a Dunkin' Donuts, and she was drinking coffee. <laughs> she said, I never had a coffee break. I was just constantly dealing with one crisis after another. And that's how I think of seventh grade. And I think, I think I never forgot that. I think, um, I think things do settle out a bit in, by grade eight, but seventh grade, it just seems like, um, you know, everything is, is, is springing up, including acne for the first time. <laughs> and everything seems like a crisis. So it's, it just makes it fun to write about. Absolutely. Um, and, and it perfectly situated for what these students are going through in your books. I originally came to you as a writer through the, your novel, Maybe He Just Likes You, a story of a young woman named Mila um, dealing with issues of personal space, bullying, uh, low-grade sexual harassment in her middle school. Um, and I based on my own experiences as a middle school teacher, and it felt 
it feels like a very important book that I will encourage my listeners to, to read, uh, have, have their kids read, their students read. How did you approach this topic um, of this young woman coming into her own, as you say, going through all these things as a young person and feeling, very much feeling the presence of boys and boys who have not been explicitly taught where the line is? How did you how did you take on this rather difficult but vital topic? When you're thinking about a seventh grade girl, she's probably going through puberty and she's becoming very self-conscious about her body. And it almost seems as if, you know, her skin is on fire. So she's very conscious of things like unwanted hugs or somebody's hand brushing against you, or somebody making a comment about your body or about your clothing. And so I was thinking that, you know, from Mila's perspective, she would be extra sensitive to these sorts of, you know, unwanted encounters with boys. Um, and she's also going through stuff with her friends. She's figuring out who her friends are and who her allies are and who she can trust, who she can talk to, who are the adults in her life she can go to in a time of crisis. And I think that, you know, all of those things are, as you say, very seventh grade because you're questioning everything. You're looking around you and you're you're trying to make sense of the world in a way that maybe you weren't able to do a year or two before. Um, and at the same time, you feel this intense self-consciousness about yourself and your body and you know where the lines are. So it, it just all came together. And what happened with me was that um, I was listening to a lot of stories, uh, reading a lot about the Me Too movement. And I was thinking, you know, I was listening to the testimony of the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. Um, and a lot of those stories were about his behavior in high school. And I was thinking, you know, this stuff doesn't start in high school. Where does it start? So I did some research and I discovered that a lot of educational experts say that sexual harassment starts in seventh grade. They pinpoint seventh grade as, as the time when it starts. And I spoke to a number of teachers who told me, um, actually, we see it well before seventh grade. But the notion is that seventh grade is when it starts. And I thought, is there a book that addresses this? And when I realized that there wasn't one, I thought, okay, we need to have a book like this on the shelves. Kids need to read it because they need to discuss this stuff and think about this stuff well before high school when it comes, you know, into full bloom. Do you talk to middle schoolers in the course of writing a book? Oh yeah, yes. And, and I have spoken to so many middle schoolers um, since the book came out and I can tell that it, that it rings true for them. And it's very interesting um, how many boys are reading it and actually like it. I was very careful not to demonize boys in the book because I think it's very important to bring them to the table, to bring them into the circle, as I did at the end. And I know that you know some people who have read the book have, have actually adults who have read the book have thought that I wasn't harsh enough with the boys' punishment at the end. But I thought that that restorative justice sort of model was really important because we can't just point our fingers at boys and say, you know, you're hopeless, you're, you're no good and you can't learn and you can't grow. The idea of the book was to show boys the girl's point of view and to promote empathy. So it was really important that I not punish them too severely, but try to bring them into the circle and, and have them understand the way Mila felt. Yeah, I thought the end of the novel was really powerful, both in terms of how Mila ultimately brings light to her struggle and then the restorative justice element, which felt very much like how schools right now are handling situations like that. And you brought up friend groups, and friend groups are so important in your, in your books. And I'm thinking of this line from Maybe He Just Likes You, where one of Mila's friends says to her something to the effect of, well, you know, 
someone's not going to hug you unless you want them to. So I thought that line was so important. The friend group trying to be supportive, but not at all seeing what her friend was going through. How, how do you create relationships that, as you say, are, are realistic, are messy, are what kids are going through? How, how do you create those interplays between characters? I think the key is knowing that in middle school, relationships are constantly in flux. I remember when my kids were in middle school, um, when they first got there, they, they had a principal who said to them, look at the kid who is sitting to your left and look at the kid who is sitting to your right. This was in fifth grade. By the time you graduate from the school in eighth grade, you will be sitting next to completely different kids, I promise you. And you know that, that really stayed with me because middle school is a time when kids are not friends simply with kids that they inherit, you know, kids that maybe are the, the children of their mom's friends or kids who are sitting next to them on the bus. They're starting to become objective about their relationships in a very healthy way. And thinking, you know, who, why am I friends with this kid exactly? <laughs> and I think that's one reason that um, so many kids, when I talk to them about maybe he just likes you, invariably the character that they want to talk about is Zara, who is the toxic friend. She's sort of the leader of the group. She's very charismatic. She's, you know, delightful in a lot of ways. And yet she is absolutely not an ally. She's threatened by this sexual harassment of her friend and jealous of it in a strange way. Um, and one of the ways that I came to her was I had a long interview with the middle school psychologist and I asked her if she saw sexual harassment and she said I never see it at my school and the reason I never see it is because it happens when grown-ups are not looking but I know that it's going on all the time because um two things will happen. One is that a group of kids will come to me and they'll say, um, our friend is being targeted and we don't know what to do. But even more commonly, a group of kids, usually a group of girls who have always been friendly, suddenly are fighting with each other. And when she brings them into her office and she says, what's going on, you guys, you've always been, you know, such good friends. She said, often at the heart of the tension in the group, um, one of the girls in the group is being targeted for sexual harassment and the other girls don't know how to deal with that. Some of them may be jealous. Some of them may be confused or threatened, but this kind of behavior brings up a lot of tensions in the friends group. When I heard that, I thought, you know, there's a lot of material here for a story because I never like to just approach a story from one um, angle. I like to come at it from different angles. And when I heard about the friendship problems that this sort of sexual harassment creates, I knew that, you know, there was material here for a whole novel. Um, so, you know, my, I, I always start these books with the assumption that, that the friendships are going to be in flux. They're going to be threatened in some way. There's going to be resolution or maybe there won't be resolution. Um, maybe sometimes you just let friendships go. That's very normal in middle school. But you know, the idea of writing a book where you have a, a protagonist and the sidekick, or protagonist and the best friend, and it stays stable throughout the whole course of the book, I just don't think that's realistic. <laughs> the psychologist's point about the mo not seeing it, but hearing about it, that resonated with me so much. It was one of the most powerful messages I got from maybe he just likes you you capture all these small moments that we teachers never see. Like these moments in the band room in that book, the proximity, the comments, the small things that mean so much to these kids that we just don't see. And I, I also really liked one of my favorite scenes, just entirely realistic and just cringeworthy was the substitute counselor, the adult who just assumes that because of his role, he can help this young woman. And it's so bad, it's so well written, but it's just, I was thinking, oh my gosh. And you know, as teachers, we've probably all done that. We think, well, I'm, I'm in this position, I can help the student. And if you have not developed that rapport. A lot of the, the grownups in that book are well-meaning and good at their jobs. They're yes, not they, evil. Yes, absolutely. 
they're, they're, they think they're trying to help, but because they don't expect to see this kind of thing, they don't see it. And I think that's true of Mr. Dolan, that, that counselor, you know, he, he genuinely believes he's being helpful. <laughs> and, you know, the, the band teacher who herself had been subjected to sexual harassment at one point in her career doesn't see it. Her own mom doesn't see it, you know, and these are all people who, who care about her. But, you know, one of the wonderful things about um, publishing this book is that a lot of um, faculty book clubs have been discussing it and doing some self-reflection and realizing that, yes, this behavior does happen in middle school. And just because we don't see it, it doesn't mean that it isn't happening. So we need to, when we see signs, little, little signs, um, like maybe a kid who's feeling self-conscious about her clothing, the way that Mila was when she was trying to talk to Mr. Dolan, maybe we, we're not hearing the right thing because we're not attuned, we're not expecting it. Maybe we should listen in a different way. I agree with all that. <laughs> Um, curious about your your thoughts on um, the larger role of social media with young people. In Violets Are Blue, the main character, Ren, uses uh, YouTube as an escape from her own self-doubt, her mom's problems, um, and quite blatantly will just go into her room and just lock herself away in, in YouTube. I'm wondering when you were writing that character and her um, her a relationship of sorts with this cat FX on on YouTube. How, how what, what were your what your thought process in terms of the um, the healthy balance for young people and social media? Yeah, that's really a tricky one, right? Um, in the way that the book is constructed, Ren's mom is struggling with an addiction, and in a parallel sort of way, so is Ren. But Ren's addiction is mostly healthy. You know, it really helps her cope. It allows her to express her creativity. Um, it allows her to connect with other kids, ultimately. But there's a sense that, <laughs> you know, it, it also isolates her um, until her mom forces her to, to join the play. And, you know, when, when she actually meets this person <laughs> who she's, whose videos she's watching, it could have gone a very different way. So, you know, I was, I was careful, very careful not to suggest that um, an internet addiction is, is something I want to promote. Um, I think there could be a very different story to be told, and I'm actually contemplating exploring that in, in, in a future book. And you, you mentioned the mom's addiction problems. In, in both Violets Are Blue and Maybe He Just Likes You, the moms are single. Uh, it's a single parent household. Um, how did you choose that setting? Um, what importance do you place on that uh, divorce in, in, uh, in the lives of middle schoolers? Well, I think it's one of those subjects that, you know, we really haven't explored enough. Um, in Maybe He Just Likes You, um, Mila has a very stable home life with her mom, who's a very responsible working mom. Um, and she doesn't see her father, so she's not really torn between the two of them. In Violets Are Blue, um, I think we have a more common situation, which is that there are two households, and um, Ren, who is an only child, is sort of shuttling back and forth between these two households and never feeling quite um, at home in either one, always feeling like she's betraying one parent if she likes them too much or if she talks too much about the other parent. I thought that because I was writing about a parent struggling with addiction, it made sense to have um, Ren be at home just alone with her mother, because if there were two parents, it would be harder for the mother to be as um, insulated, as isolated. And 
I wanted, I wanted Ren to be dealing with her mom's addiction all on her own and feeling like she couldn't talk to her dad about it because she didn't want to be betraying her mom. So it just made sense for the, the subject of the book, which is really about secrecy because Ren has secrets from her mom. Her mom has secrets from her. Um, they both have secrets from the dad. The dad had a secret life. Um, so it just made sense for the construction of the book. I will say that my next book, which is coming out in September, which is called Haven Jacob Saves the Planet, about a seventh grader who has what's called eco-anxiety, which is anxiety about the climate crisis, um, is in a household with two very present parents who are, are so tight that it seems to re it seems to Haven often that you know they're speaking a language. Um, to each other just by giving each other certain looks that she's excluded from. So that's a very different kind of household. I like to write about different kinds of families. Excellent. Uh, how about uh, your own childhood? How did you grow into being a writer? Um, how, and as you, I know you have, I think you were, a, you practiced law, right? You went to law school. Yeah. So it's to, you, you made your way into writing. How, how did you make your way into writing? <laughs> well, I, I always wrote, I, I have on my website, um, the first book I ever wrote, which I wrote when I was five, <laughs> um, about a boy named Mitchell Collapse who has a robot. Um, so I was always writing books. And um, when I was in middle school, I kept a journal. I wrote poetry. I was an English major in college. I was an English teacher, a high school English teacher for five years. And then I went to law school. Um, I wrote on the law review um, and practiced law for a few years, then was a stay at home mom. And as my kids were, were sort of segueing into full-time school, I thought, okay, I've always wanted to see if I could be published. Here's my chance. If it doesn't happen, I'll go back to being a teacher or a lawyer, or I'll do something else, but I'll never forgive myself if I don't at least see if I could get published. So I wrote one manuscript, sent it around. It got some nice feedback, you know, some very encouraging feedback, but no offers for publication. And then I wrote another manuscript, sent it around, and that one did get published. It, it was just another day in my insanely real life, which came out in 2006. Um, published by Simon & Schuster, which is still my publisher today. So, you know, <laughs> it, I, I, I often tell kids, and I think this is a really important thing for them to know, that if you want to be a writer, there isn't one path you have to take. It's not like you have to go to one school or take one class or have one teacher. And when you graduate from college, it's not like you say, okay, henceforth, I am a published author. It's really good to travel, to try other careers, um, to take a few different paths to take your time and to build up experiences because all of those experiences end up going into your written work. Probably a lot of adults out there that would appreciate that advice. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Could you talk me through your writing process? Maybe we start with the new book coming out this fall. Um, how, how do you, from, from the beginning, from the first seed of a story, how does a novel come together for you? Well, every book is different. Every book is different. And that's another thing that I always tell kids. It's not like you have one way of working and that's it forever. You have to be open to changing your way of working depending on the book. For Haven Jacob Saves the Planet, which is a book about the kid who has eco-anxiety and is um, deals with it by channeling all this anxiety into a local project, which is saving a local river. I spent a lot of time before I actually started writing, speaking to educators who do stream studies with their students. I spoke to several middle school teachers, a high school teacher and a college professor. And they all walked me through how they do stream studies with their students, how their students behave, when they're doing these stream studies. So I got a lot of background material and then I started writing. Um, I always tell kids that there are two kinds of writers, the pantsers and the plotters. They don't know this stuff. Pantsers write by the seat of their pants. They have absolutely no idea what they're gonna write from day to day. 
I used to be a writer like that when I started my career. Um, and then I became a plotter, somebody who wrote a pretty detailed synopsis of my story before I started writing. And this would be something like a 10 page single spaced outline with even little snippets of conversations between characters. And it gave me a sort of, um, you know, a, a working outline for the book. I thought when, once I got to that point, I thought, okay, this is how I'm working from now on. This is great because plot is always something that, you know, I struggle with. Um, so it really helps to have all the plot points worked out in advance. And then I can just focus on, you know, the writing. But after I got to that point, um, I sort of migrated to the middle of that spectrum. And now I'm sort of a hybrid pants or plotter, um, a, pl a planter. <laughs> I, I have a good sense of where I'm going. Um, and some of that is dictated to by the research that I've done, like the research I was describing for Haven Jacobs. Um, but I don't necessarily have it all, all the plot points written out um, in advance because, you know, it's fun to explore. It's fun to sort of feel your way in the dark and, and be open to changing uh, the way that the story is going. So I'm sort of, I'm sort of in the middle of that spectrum at this point. Do you ever see your characters in, in real life? You're out doing your, your day-to-day -day life, maybe visiting with students, talking with experts. Do you ever, do you ever find any of your characters suddenly are, are there like, oh, wow, that, that might be Mila right there. Yeah. Do you ever, do you ever, I wonder, what about your relationship with these characters that you create? Yeah. It's more like I hear them than I see them. You know, I, I have a very strong sense of how they sound. And sometimes when I'm talking to kids, I hear them and I have a little moment. I think, oh, <laughs> that was weird. Um, yeah. And I also hear from kids all the time. They write me emails or even letters and they'll say, you know, this character is me. This was me. And, um, they will often say, this is the first time that I have read a book in which I saw myself. And, you know, what's better than that? That is so powerful. Yeah. Wow. In um, Valister Blue, Ren says that she talks a bit about her messy feelings, um, trying to deal with her own messy feelings and her mom not being able to deal with her messy feelings. And I think that's maybe one of the greatest things you brought to your novels that what, what the kids are going through. Um, I'm curious, I'm just going off topic here for a sec, what's uh, your thoughts on everything that's happening in this country right now regarding books, young people, um, libraries pulling books, schools, books being challenged, um, basically a wave of censorship that this country is seeing. Um, wonder what you've been feeling as you've been reading that news. Well, it breaks my heart. Um, you know, I, I see my mission with writing books as, you know, exploring really important topics that some people consider tough topics. I consider them real topics. And these are real things that real kids are going through every day. And when we snatch books off the shelves, we're, we're telling kids that their reality doesn't matter. It's tragic. I have personally had two um, well, more than two instances of my books being snatched, either directly or indirectly. When my book Starcross came out, which is about an eighth grade girl who is discovering her own bisexuality, um, I was shut down in the middle of a school presentation, told by teachers, sixth grade teachers, that I shouldn't talk about that book. Um, that book has since then been um, included on the banned books list in Texas. When Maybe He Just Likes You came out, just the, like the very week that it came out, I was invited to several schools in the Chicago area, middle schools. And for the first schools that I was invited to, I was speaking about the book to, you know, the whole grade. So it was like something like 500 kids at a time. When I got to one of the schools, I was met at the door by the school librarian who 
told me she loved the book. She read it. It's just come out. She just read it and loved it and was sharing it with other teachers at her school, including the health teachers, because they were having, you know, discussions with, with students about things like consent and boundaries and respect. Um, and th these teachers all loved it. And then she led me to her library and she said, here's where you're going to be meeting the students. And I thought, oh, that's strange. It must be a really huge library because I had just been speaking to 500 students at a time. She led me into the library and there were 10 students sitting there. And I said, where, where are all the other students? And the teacher, this librarian took a moment and she looked at me and she said, I have to tell you that what happened was when our principal heard the subject of your book, he sent the kids in the school home with a permission slip, which they had to have signed by their parents in order to attend your talk. And so, you know, only 10 kids showed up with the permission slip because everybody else had gotten the message that this book was, you know, R-rated. It was inappropriate. Um, and so that's an example of soft censorship. You know, we talk, we know when, when a book is on a, a banned book list, we can all see the list. We all know that the book is there. Um, and, you know, that's obviously disgusting and tragic. But what many authors face is something like what I just described, where, yes, you're allowed in the school. Yes, the book is allowed on the shelf. But, and it's that but that, you know, is really almost as dangerous. In a way, it's even more dangerous. Um, because then the school has, you know, um, deniability. They can say, oh, we're promoting, you know, reading about all sorts of things, but not really. And that that's what happened with that book. And it was, it was, you know, it was, it was awful. It was an awful moment. And I said to the librarian, has the principal read the book? And she looked at me and she said, no. And I think that's your whole answer right there. When books are challenged, the first question we should ask is, have you actually read this book? <laughs> because if you have read this book, you will know that the subject is treated in an age appropriate way. And I think, you know, too often adults will think about a book that's about racism or, or sexuality, sexual orientation, and assume that because it's about those subjects, it is, you know, R-rated, inappropriate for middle schoolers. If they read the book, they will see that there are authors who know how to approach these subjects in an age-appropriate way and promote conversation with adults. And I never understand why any adult would want to take themselves out of a conversation. If we don't share books about these subjects with kids, it's not as if kids are not going to know about these subjects. They're just going to you know, explore these subjects in inappropriate ways. Either they will read stuff off the internet that we might not want them to read, or they will talk to their friends and sort of reinforce each other's wrong-headed ideas. Or maybe they will read, you know, YA, which is, you know, very dark, much more dark energy than we necessarily want our middle schoolers to, to be reading. If we don't give our kids middle grade books, that approach these subjects in ways that are suitable for middle schoolers, you know, <laughs> and we take ourselves out of the conversation and, and, and we don't, you know, promote back and forth about these subjects. How are we serving our kids? We're not. Yeah, as soon as you started that story, I thought there's no way that principal read the book. Because that's what we're seeing over and over in all these cases. It's people that haven't actually read it. They hear the subject matter, and that's the end of the conversation. Exactly. And and your books, looping back to the beginning of, of this conversation, are so perfectly situated in that middle school world, age-appropriate, perfect for these conversations. Kids don't need to go out and try to find this stuff. They can have great conversations in school with caring adults because of books like yours. And, uh, and I'm going to be... Uh, 
promoting your books as much as possible and really appreciate you joining me today um, and, and all the work that you're doing. Really important for, for middle school students, for parents, for anybody that can get their hands on it. So Barbara D., thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. A huge thanks to Barbara D. for taking the time to talk about her writing process and her books and how she comes to create such rich characters. I can't say enough good things about her books, and I really encourage you as a parent, as a teacher, as a student to pick up one of her books. Uh, personally, as I said during the interview, Maybe He Just Likes You is an incredibly powerful and urgent book for this time dealing with sexual harassment and boundaries in middle school. And as you heard Barbara say, that's where it starts. If that book can create conversations in your family, can prompt conversations in your school, then what else could we ask for from a book? But that's not her only book. She has 11 other books, a new one coming out this fall. And and I really encourage you to check her out. I'll link her website and some books in the show notes. Um, and uh, this is just a really amazing way to reach our middle schoolers who are at a time when reaching them and connecting with them is so important. Thanks for checking out What's the Big Idea. As always, check me out on Twitter and Instagram at Big Idea Ed. I appreciate you taking the time as the school year winds down to listen. Thanks everyone. Stay safe. See you next time.